to 9-11, there was a great debate of what should be built at the World Trade Center. It was quintessential New York, passionate, loud, fractious. But one thing was clear, and that is the new World Trade Center had to embody significantly more than the old one did. Throughout the process, everyone involved was mindful of the extremely delicate balance that had to be achieved. Of course, we all understood that our primary responsibility was to commemorate the almost 3,000 people who lost their lives on that day. At the same time, however, we also had to restore the commerce that had defined the lower tip of Manhattan from the beginning of the city's history. And of course, any plan for downtown's revitalization had to undo the mistakes made when the original World Trade Center was built, when it literally cut itself off from the rest of New York. We had to knit the new World Trade Center into the downtown community and offer meaningful ways for New Yorkers and visitors to engage the site at street level, primarily through grand open spaces, transportation, culture, and new shops and restaurants could this be accomplished. In the midst of all of that chaos and the competing visions at the time, New York's then Governor George Pataki and, Mike, and Mayor Michael Bloomberg launched an unprecedented international design competition to develop a master plan that would incorporate the opinions of all New Yorkers and unify all the stakeholders at the site. Streeter Daniel Liebeskin was the winner of that competition. And Daniel did a terrific job in listening to these competing voices. He knew that it was fundamental to balance the memory of the tragedy that had changed so many lives with the need to foster a vibrant exciting and working neighborhood. It has taken more time than we had hoped it would, but today all of those elements that make a dynamic urban community are in place. And in just over a little more than a week, New Yorkers will celebrate the opening of three World Trade Center, the next new building on the 16-acre site at the World Trade Center, a 1,250-foot tall, two-and-a-half-million-square-foot office tower. It's my great pleasure to introduce Carla Swickenrath, CEO of Studio Daniel Liebeskin. And Carla will walk you through the master planning process that began back in 2003 whose goal was to achieve an even greater vision of the world's greatest city. Carla. Thank you, Larry. Um, first of all, I want to congratulate you on your award last night. Um, your commitment to this site and this project has been phenomenal. Um, throughout the project, with all of its challenges, Larry's vision never wavered. Um, you're the real deal, and you delivered what you promised, so thank you. Um, so, as Larry said, we were invited in 2002 to compete in the competition for um, ideas for the master plan for the World Trade Center. Uh, what was particularly exciting and challenging, obviously, was the fact that there were many competing voices. There were people who said, build nothing at all. The whole site should be a memorial. There were people who said, build it as exactly as it was in defiance. Um, I think most people knew that there had to be a different answer. 
Um, here, here's an image from the, the actual last presentation where, where Daniel was uh, awarded the master plan. And I think one of the biggest challenges we had was not only dealing with all the different stakeholders, but really bringing together these two different competing ideas that we had to commemorate the lives that were lost on that day, which could never be forgotten. Yet we had to reestablish Lower Manhattan as the cultural and commercial capital of the world. So those, th those are obviously very difficult challenges and done under extreme scrutiny, <laughs> which I think the project benefited from. Here are some initial sketches. Um, as you can see sketched on the bottom there, it says memory foundations. Um, key inspiration for us for the site. There you can see one of the original sketches from the masculine competition and a rendering of what will be there soon. Uh, currently Tower 1 and 4 are there, the Memorial, the Memorial Museum. Tower 3, as Larry said, is opening next week and hopefully Tower 2 will be on its way soon. Um, here you can see the overall site for the project. Um, for us, from the very beginning, we knew that the 16 acres was sacred, every square inch of it. So we said, no matter with the fact that we have to have 10 million square feet of office space, we have to have retail, we have to have public transportation, we need to have a memorial, we need to have streets, and we need to have a vibrant community, that we have to dedicate more than half of the site to the memorial. And that's a pretty large commitment in Lower Manhattan to dedicate eight acres of the site to basically public space. And here you can see the outline of that, of that memorial. In purple, you see a line, and that's highlighting the slurry wall, which is underground. During the competition, the site was still a cleanup effort. We were invited one day by the Port Authority when we were there visiting to go down into the site if we wanted to. And we went down into the bedrock, standing there 70 feet below grade, and we looked up at that wall. And Daniel said to the Port Authority engineer, what is that? It's leaking. He said, oh, it's the slurry wall. If it weren't for that wall, standing, cradling the disaster as it fell into the bathtub, the disaster could have been worse. And so at that moment, Daniel felt that standing on that bedrock, 70 feet below grade, and looking up at that slurry wall, knowing that that's the foundation, that you can break some buildings, but you can't break our, our spirit. And so the slurry wall kind of became a symbol of, of the strength of our democracy and became a, a critical component within the project. Uh, given its location on the site, along the edge and creating that eight acres where the two footprints of the original towers were, creating that as the memorial and the sacred space, we actually created a three-dimensional space for the memorial and for the museum. So all the way to the 70 feet below grade with the slurry wall and the plaza above. And now you can see the slurry wall is part of the memorial museum that's underground. And one of the things we all had to consider that this memorial and this museum happened on the site of the tragedy. Often memorials are built elsewhere or museums dedicated to something are further away. But for many people, this is the last resting place of their, their loved ones. So we always um, treaded with great humility throughout the project. And now the memorial and the museum underground are open. And that slurry wall, kind of the hero of the day, um, remains standing. And there you can see the, the underground now in the Memorial Museum with the footprint to the right is actually the footprint of the tower above. And what's, what's fantastic is also that it lets us ex excavate and you see the original box columns and the edges of the original towers. So there's a, a real sense of history along with the artifacts from the day. And there have been great events here. The Pope came and even decided to preside over an ecumenical uh, presentation in front of the slurry wall. And then the memorial at grade actually is above the memorial museum and connects all of the elements of the master plan together and creates that eight acre public space. Um, one of the main components are the two footprints of the original towers that are preserved forever. 
Here you can see Michael Arad and Peter Walker's uh, competition winning design that commemorates both of those footprints with the waterfalls with the names of the victims around the, the edges of the waterfall. And as you stand along the edge, I think you get a tremendous sense of the enormity of the tragedy with the 200 by 200 foot footprints of the original tower. And here you can see how one of the most important aspects of the memorial was that it had to be open in public. We didn't want tickets and we didn't want security edges, although security had to be a major component for the project, we want it to be open and part of Lower Manhattan. And here you can see a view from above with Tower One on the right and the World Financial Center beyond. Another important thing was as a master planner, how do we inscribe meaning into the urban fabric? Um, Daniel had an idea that we would inscribe the wedge of light from 8.46 a.m. to 10.28 a.m., the time that the first tower was hit until the second tower fell, and no light would shine on that plaza. And along that plaza would be the transportation hub. We also felt that, um, this is an original sketch, that the transportation hub had to be a civic icon. We didn't want another Penn Station as we have today. We wanted another Grand Central Station. And Santiago Calatrava, was hired by the Port Authority to develop that. As you know, it's, it's open today. It's a spectacular building. And one of the most interesting things that happened along the way was that Santiago was looking at the master plan and understood the wedge of light. And instead of having that be the edge of the tra transportation center, he said, I want to make it the center. So the line along the oculus is actually the light line from the 1028 AM time and every day on September 11th every year, you can see the sun shining straight in. And I think that's a great example of a master plan working well. We always thought the master plan is not intended to be an instrument of torture. It's actually meant to inspire the architects that are gonna work with us. And so when Calatrava came with this idea, we thought, oh, isn't it spectacular that the project gets enhanced with the collaboration. And there you can see in context with the, one of the edges of the fountains. Another component that we thought was incredibly important was culture. We knew that in general this project was our cultural response to what happened on September 11th. There were political, military responses, but we, we knew that how we rebuilt was gonna define who we are. And we wanted a 24 seven active and vibrant neighborhood. So in addition to the office spaces and the retail and the memorial and the transportation hub, there's also two cultural buildings. One is a performing arts center and of course the visitor um, center that brings you down into the memorial below. And there you can see the Performing Arts Center next to Tower One, done by Rex. And here's an image of it along the memorial. So again, at the nexus of the site, at the center, really making culture a component. And there, you see the transportation hub again and the Snowheadas Visitor Center on the right and uh, Tower 3 beyond that will be opening. So in addition to all of the complexity of the ground plane and the, the components that had to come together, obviously we had 10 million square feet of office space to fit on this site. Um, one of the things we thought from the very beginning that was incredibly important, number one, is we had to balance the memory and, and the, the rebuilding. But we also wanted to create an image on the skyline so that even if you weren't standing at the site, you would see it on the skyline and recognize where it was. And we configured the towers in a way that kind of spiraled from five, four, three, two, one, up to tower one, which is 1,776 feet tall. And it's kind of like the upstretched arm of the Statue of Liberty. And so creating that composition slightly off the grid would always be recognized wherever you were in the city. We also wanted to reconnect the street grid the original World Trade Center created an island and it wasn't really great for urban and public space. So we thought, what's the best thing about New York? It's the street grid, it's, it's the urban fabric. So we really connected all the streets back through with Greenwich going through the site north-south, Fulton going all the way water to water, and uh, Cortland and Liberty going beneath. We also wanted all of the office tower lobbies to be on the memorial side so that we wouldn't have a lot of retail and 
functions facing the memorial. With the respect, although the memorial is totally public and open for anybody, um, we tried to keep all the retail entrances on the outside of the memorial, which also lined up with the retail components already on, on Church Street. And there you can see the composition with Tower 1, designed by SOM at the height, um, Tower 2, which is designed by Big, Tower 3, which is Richard Rogers, and Tower 4, which is Fumamako Maki. And then, of course, you see the, the memorial below. And there it is on the skyline. And, of course, Tower 1 is the, is the height of the composition. And we wanted to move the tallest tower toward West Street because Lower Manhattan, as you know, is incredibly dense, and we're adding 10 million square feet. And since we weren't doing a megastructure, we were breaking it down into buildable towers, we, we had to spread them out on the site instead of having a single tall tower. So we moved the tower toward West Street, which helped to expand the urban center of Lower Manhattan. There you can see the composition. And here are a few images just through the site as it stands today, looking at Tower One along the memorial. And it, it, it's amazing that no matter what time of the day, what day of the week, rain, snow, sunshine, people are standing around this memorial. It's, and there are the main components again, the slurry wall, which is underground with the Memorial Museum, the two footprints that anchor the memorial on the public space, um, the transportation hub, and then the towers culminating in Tower One in the composition. And now you can see where we are today above with Tower One built, the memorial thriving, the museum um, also thriving in Tower Three, coming online soon. And many people thought when the tragedy happened that Lower Manhattan was over. People were building in New Jersey, thinking about where they may recenter. And actually, the new downtown is pretty astonishing, and we've lived through it. We moved from Berlin to New York in 2003 when we won the competition, and we've watched the transformation of the neighborhood. Um, the population has tripled since 2001. We have top-rated restaurants there now, um, tripled the number of hotel rooms in Lower Manhattan. Um, residential neighborhoods of Tribeca and Battery Park have, you know, highest sales in New York City and Lower Manhattan actually financial district. Um, 1.5 million square feet of retail has been added, and 5.7 million people have visited the Memorial Museum since its opening in May 2014. So here's a few images, and again, I think this shows the street grids continuing, making this, this development part of New York City and not an island, noticing it from wherever you are, having a memorial that can be at one moment commemorative but also celebratory, a public space where New Yorkers can have a lunch, which there isn't much public space in lower Manhattan. Visitors can come from around the world. And here you see the towers, which are set off from the memorial, not sh shadowing the memorial, and stitching into the existing grid of New York City. And I leave you with the last thought. Daniel actually immigrated to New York. He was born in Poland and immigrated into New York, New York as a teenager, and he actually arrived by boat. And he talked about the day that he woke up on the, the ship and saw the Statue of Liberty. He actually had that experience as he immigrated. And he always thought that as you enter the harbor and you see this on the skyline, it should be as incredible as the Statue of Liberty. Thank you very much.